Welcome to City Church Worship at Home. Today is November 22nd, Sunday morning, obviously. Um, we're glad you're with us. Uh, if you're checking out City Church for the first time, maybe you had a friend invite you, uh, or you just stum stumbled upon our link on YouTube or on Facebook, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're in the midst of a series uh, looking at how the gospel speaks into uh, this chaotic world in which we live right now. Uh, specifically, uh, how does the gospel empower us and what does the gospel compel us to do as it relates to living out the kingdom of God in the midst of the chaos? Before we begin worshiping, though, I want to call us into worship uh, with these words from Psalm 30. God, you have turned our mourning into dancing. You've taken away our funeral clothes and reclothed us in joy so that our whole being, body, mind, and soul might sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, our Lord, we will give thanks to you forever. Pray with me if you would. Our Father in the heavens, we thank you for your son Jesus, uh, for his life, death, and resurrection, for the way that it draws us into your presence. Uh, God, we ask this morning that you would send your spirit among us, to draw us into your presence and give us a sense of what it's like to worship together with the angels and with the saints who've gone on before us. Our God, that's our prayer and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. I wonder 
God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden sings my soul my Savior God to me how great thou art how great thou art and sings my soul my Savior God to me how Our first scripture lesson comes from Psalm 4, verses 6 through 8. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep for you, Lord. Make me dwell in safety. As we gather together, we have an opportunity to confess together. And we're called into confession with these words. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the inmost heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullest confidence that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help in the hour of need. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God. Based on Hebrews 4, 14, and 16. We'll confess together using the prayer written on the screen, and then I'll give you some time to confess silently. Most gracious and most merciful God, we confess to you and to one another that time after time we have entered your presence with countless prayers, but with hearts that have been close to your grace. We have lifted our hands to you in praise, but our feet have still walked in the ways of evil. We have rehearsed your commandments, but have refused to see your face in the needs of our neighbor. We pray, Lord, that you forgive our lack of faith and pardon our acts of injustice. Grant us the healing that comes from your presence and the cleansing of your all-powerful word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we confess the way we've sinned against you and against one another. Oh, break us by the power of your grace. Oh, Lord, won't you break us by the power of your grace. Oh, break us, remake us, don't let sorrow take us.
good news of the gospel is this. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? As we pray together, we'll be giving you a moment of silence to pray using the prompts on the screen. I'll conclude with, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. Merciful and loving God, we thank you for your love that will never leave us, no matter who we are, what we're doing, or what is happening in our lives. We thank you for your healing and guiding spirit. Give us eyes to see as you see and a patient and generous heart. Teach us to love our neighbors and your creation with gentleness and courage and to become more and more like your son Jesus, who gave everything of himself to give us true and eternal life. And now you can take a moment to pray at home. Jesus, give me joy.
mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we conclude by praying as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Hey, good morning, City Church. I'm so thankful that you have joined us this morning for this online worship resource. And we wanna take an opportunity to remind you that the peace of Jesus is yours this morning. When we gather, whether it is online or in our physical gathering, we are reminded each week of the gospel, the good news that Jesus' death for us, his resurrection for us, his life and death in our place, is what gives us good news that we are reconciled to God. We have peace with God because of this. And so we want to take an opportunity to pass the peace of Jesus to you and to give you a chance to pass the peace of Jesus on to someone else. And so it, it's a great opportunity for you to take out your phone or, or on some messenger and, and be able to pass the peace of Jesus to someone. Remind them of the good news of the gospel. So we're thankful that you have joined us in this way. Um, we also have our live in-person gathering that has resumed. And so if you want to join us at any point uh, for those live gatherings, you can go on our website um, and you can reserve a spot for one of those just to let us know that you're coming and that would be incredible. We know that um, the numbers have gone up a bit recently and uh, we're watching that very closely. So we want to make sure that we give you the best, uh, safest, opportunity to be with God's people on Sunday. So, um, so make sure that you check that, check that out on the website if you can and will. Um, but if you are still not able and, and want to just hold off, we're going to continue to have this resource uh, well into the future uh, indefinitely. So thanks for joining us this morning. A couple things that I do want to remind you about other than uh, the live gathering that we do have going on. Um, this coming week is going to be the week of Thanksgiving, and so the schedule is going to change a bit. Um, we are going to have our Tuesday morning prayer gathering, prayer meeting on Zoom. Uh, you can find that on the front page of the website as well. Uh, but we are not going to have our uh, Alpha or Wednesday Night Church on Wednesday, and we are not going to be gathering on Friday for our happy hour that we normally do. Um, but we will be uh, resuming those the following week. Now, this Sunday, we are finishing up our series, uh, The Kingdom and the Chaos. Pastor Brad's going to be sharing uh, with us out of uh, our last part of the series. And then starting next week, we're going to be uh, entering into the season, my favorite season of the, the, the year year is the season of Advent leading into Christmas. And so we're thankful that we get to, um, as God's people, remember that he came and why he came the first time as we look forward to Christ coming again. And so we're going to take a season, um, four weeks to reflect on that. And so we would love for you to join us, whether online or in person, uh, for those things. So I'm going to pray, and then Pastor Brad's going to come uh, after we have our second reading. So Father, we are grateful that we do get to take this one last opportunity to think about what it looks like and means to be the kingdom of God, to be representatives of the kingdom of God in the midst of the things around us that just feel so chaotic. So I pray that you would empower us, uh, Holy Spirit, to uh, love and to do good as you have done this work in us. Your grace to us would extend to others, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sermon text comes from John 16, 16 to 22. Jesus went on to say, 
In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. I'd like to start today's broadcast with a confession. On Wednesday evening, November 18th of 2020, our family put up our Christmas tree and we decorated it. Actually, we put up two trees. There's one over here and there's one over there. Friends, we decorated our whole house with lights and, and with Christmas cheer. I mean, just look at that. I know I'm getting the judgment of many of you out there right now. I mean, how can anyone put up Christmas decorations the week before Thanksgiving? To which I reply, listen, it's 2020, get off my back, all right? And guess what, I'm not alone. Uh, the Guardian reported, is it too early to put up Christmas decorations? Not after the year we've had. Out of New York City, they're reporting with 2020 being a stressful drag so far, it's not too early to start putting up Christmas decorations. Thank you. Bangor, Maine is reporting in 2020, early Christmas decorations are bringing Mainers some much needed cheer. Amen. And USA Today reported, Christmas lights even before Thanksgiving, there's a reason behind it, experts say. And here's exactly what expert Dr. Christine Bacho, professor of psychology out of, Syri out of Syracuse said. She said, on the surface, the first thing that you could argue easily is that lights, which obviously are associated with joy and bring back a lot of good memories, are a way of alleviating depression, Sadness, feeling down, anxiety, stress, all the things the pandemic has increased. See, our family isn't crazy. We're perfectly normal. And listen, even before this pandemic, we, all of us, were looking for joy. If you Google right now how to be happy, you will get over 2 billion results. You can take a 1,000 different happiness quizzes online, self-improvement uh, is a $10 billion industry in this country. There are uh, 5,000 plus motivational speakers in the United States. There's a Hindu woman in India named Amma. She's known as the hugging saint. Yes, she gives hugs of happiness. And you would think, really, people go to a strange woman they don't even know to get a hug? Yeah, over 33 million people have gone to Amma to get a hug. And it seems like right now, in November of 2020, we could all use a hug right now. Almost everyone I talk to feels like they are in a pressure cooker, the pandemic, the rising numbers, the civil unrest, the political unrest, and everyone is a little disillusioned with the world. 2020, what is happening? All these problems we're having. The Bible would say that the Unrest you see in the world uh, is not caused by the pand pandemic or by the election or by social media. What those things did is they exposed us. And the Bible says that the trouble between us is because there's a trouble within us. That is, if you are mad at others on the outside, it's because you're mad within yourself. If you argue with others, it's because you're arguing within yourself. If you lie to others, it's because you lie to yourself. If you accuse others, it's because 
you accuse yourself. You're, you're unhappy with others because you are unhappy within. That's how the Bible puts it. And, and what has happened in this pressure cooker that is 2020 is that we all got exposed. The world is unstable because inside of us, we are unstable. And there's only one thing the Bible says that can stabilize us, make us unsad, not angry, not mad, not hostile. It's called gospel. That word means news that creates joy. So if you think the world got exposed in 2020, which means you got exposed in 2020 because you're part of this one humanity, then maybe, just maybe, what you need is a little more joy. So I want to begin talking about the necessity of joy. Here's here's the big thing you need to know. God is after your joy. Jesus says in this passage in verse 22, you will rejoice, not some will and some won't. Theologians categorize joy as a communicable attribute of God. Now, what does that mean? Think of it this way. COVID-19 is a communicable attribute. Disease. If you have it and you're near someone, spending time with someone else, you can pass it on to them. Joy is something that if, if we get close to God, if we spend time with God, if we, if we really know God, joy, His joy gets passed on to us because joy is something God has. How many of us have a picture of God in our minds of a God who is just far away and transcendent, maybe like, some cosmic cop in the sky. No, God is a God of joy. In Proverbs 8, it tells us about creation. We're told, God says, every day I was creating, I was delighting in mankind, and I was filled with delight every day. The word delight there means actually to frolic, to to jump up and down, to clap your hands. When the world was made, God was not apathetic about it. He was not detached. He was ecstatic. He was filled with joy and with dancing. And when you draw a line from there to the New Testament, Jesus' first miracle is what? I mean, you would think God comes to earth. What should the miracle be? Let's raise someone from the dead. That's going to be the first miracle. Or the first miracle should be let's, let's heal a leper. Let's feed the poor. No, Jesus goes to a party and it's a bust. The booze cart is empty and Jesus turns water into wine. Jesus saves the party. Restoring joy is the first thing that Jesus does. One of Jesus' favorite stories that he told was of a prodigal son, a runaway son who screwed up his life, who squandered wealth, and who felt really bad about it. And he comes home and he's dejected and he's rehearsing this speech that he's going to go before his father and ask if he could be a slave in his father's house. And he comes home and there's a party for him. Why? Because restoring joy is intrinsic to what Jesus came to do. You know what a lot of people think Christianity is? It's, they think it's anti-joy, that it's a bus, that it's a drag. It makes people uptight, guilt-ridden. Most people in our society want to get free from this guilt-inducing influence uh, that religion has on us, from an influence that says, hey, you want to be a Christian? Well, go clean up your act, go to church, pass out bulletins, set up chairs. It's not too exciting, but it's the price we all pay to avoid eternal damnation. No, God came into the world and he is after your joy. Remember, that's what the word gospel means. Joy news. Therefore, if you, are a, if you are a Christian, it's because you have this gospel. That means you already have this joy, which means if you are lacking joy, you are actively doing something to stifle it. The prayer isn't so much, um, God, give me more joy. It's, God, what in the world am I doing to stifle this thing that is in the center of my soul or I wouldn't even be a Christian And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the definition of joy and what stifles it. And and, and here we'll need to parse out the difference between counterfeit joy and real joy. Because the implication from verse 22 is that a counterfeit joy is any kind of joy that is temporary and circumstantial. So consider this. What do you think will bring you joy? Where is that place where you secretly build your happiness? That place, that, that thing that, that captures your imagination, that, 
place you go to and you make your deposits there all the time, only to find that it makes withdrawals from you constantly. It's when you get something you want. It makes you feel good, but then it doesn't. If your joy is your career and you get a promotion, you feel blessed. It works for a while, but then it doesn't because now you have to climb another ladder and the anxiety you realize didn't go away and now you have new competition and and, and, and peers making you feel insecure. Thomas Oden, I love how he put this. Uh, He said, suppose my treasure is sex or my physical health or the Republican Party. If I experience any of those under threat, I feel shaken to my depths. Guilt becomes neurotically intensified to the degree I have idolized finite values. Suppose I value my ability to teach and communicate clearly. If clear communication has become an absolute value to me, a centering value that makes all values valuable, then if I fail, I'm stricken with neurotic guilt. Bitterness becomes intensified if someone or something stands between me and my ultimate value. Did you hear what he said? Counterfeit joy is the idolization of finite values that create a temporary happiness completely based on circumstances, which means you're exposed. You and I, we are incredibly vulnerable. If you find yourself routinely restless, anxious within, you feel like you're on an emotional or spiritual roller coaster, will you consider that what you're after is potentially a counterfeit joy in your life and that what you really long for is the real thing? Now, what does the real thing look like? Here it is. Real joy is a permanent condition. It's not temporary and it runs concurrently with hardship. I mean, of course, anybody can be joyous when things are going well. Anyone can be joyous after a difficulty has proven to to grow them by strides. But real joy doesn't come after the difficulty. It comes in the midst of it. Verse 21 is fascinating. Jesus uses the metaphor of a woman giving birth. Verse 21, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Now, I watched this happen with my wife and the birth of our two boys. I know the pain only secondhand. I know through observing uh, that childbirth is painful and, and there is suffering and there is anguish. But I also know and observed that when the child is born, as Jesus says here, the woman forgets her suffering because of the joy of seeing the child in her arms. And I know that the pain isn't over. She knows the pain isn't over. There's recovery. There's more suffering. But this joy will make you forget your pain, but it doesn't mean the pain is gone. That's what Jesus is talking about here. What what happens is this. The joy overwhelms the pain. So do you want to know what Christianity can do for your life? It can give you an internal, deep rest at the worst moment. (laughs) When the rejection letter comes in the mail, when the boyfriend breaks up with you, when your best client moves to a competitor, when you lose the job because of the pandemic, when you fall on your face in failure, when you lose your reputation because you made a big, giant mistake. When the test results come back positive. Listen, internal, deep rest at the worst moment. This is what that thing called gospel can do in your life. And that is the meaning of verse 22. So with you, Jesus says, now is your time of grief but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And listen, no one will take away your joy. It is a non-temporary, non-circumstantial, permanent condition. And if you want it, you can have it. It's why Jesus came into the world to restore our joy. And here's how you get it. Finally, the location of joy. Verse 18 
says that as Jesus was explaining these things, the disciples didn't understand it. So Jesus had to keep explaining these things. So what was Jesus trying to explain to them in the first place? Well, that he was going to suffer for them. Uh, He was going to give up his life for them. And do you know that is exactly what Jesus wants you and I to meditate on as well? That he came to give up his life for you. For all the ways in which you pursued counterfeit joy, for all the ways you try to make life all about the gifts and the circumstances instead of the giver of the gifts, that fractured relationship that has made us sad and angry and hostile within and without, Jesus came to restore our joy. The author of Hebrews talks about Jesus going to the cross to do this, but adds the most amazing context for us. Hebrews 12, 2, speaking of Jesus, he says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, did you catch that? The joy set before Jesus. The joy set before the mother that allows her to endure the pain of childbirth, of course, is what? The child. She knows the joy is coming. The child is coming, so she endures and she faces it. Friends, what was the joy set before Jesus that gave him the energy and the strength to endure the suffering of the cross? That joy was you. So meditate on this until it fills your soul with delight. You are the joy set before Jesus. This past week, I got to hold the baby of my sister-in-law for the first time. And I had seen pictures and from afar and thought, that's a cute baby. But then I got to hold the baby. She was beautiful. And whenever I held her, I, I... did something I did with my boys when they were infants. I used my baby voice. Uh, I hum songs. I don't know the nursery rhyme, so I just make up, you know, my own words. And I used to do this with my kids, you know, rocking them in the chair and just staring at them and thinking in that moment of staring at them that there is nothing more beautiful, nothing more valuable to me than this precious child. And I would use my baby voice and I would sing over them. Do you know when your life changes forever? When you realize that's not even close to how much joy God has when he sings over you. And oh yes, he sings over you. Zephaniah 317, the Lord takes delight in you and he will rejoice over you with singing. You want more joy in your life? Go to Jesus and take delight in his delight over you. Let me pray for us. God, we ask that you would help us to see that delight, see you singing over us with love and with joy, and that that would fill our our sad souls, our anxious souls, our restless souls with joy. Displace all of those emotions and feelings and moods and activities that, that, that harm ourselves and harm others and displace it with joy. Help us to see Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. We've taken the time today to sing about this gospel, this joy news. We've, we've sung it, we've, we've read it, we've, we've heard it, and now we're going to affirm it. So let's do that together. Let's affirm our faith together. I believe that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. Friends, thanks once again for joining us here at City Church Worship at Home. I want to remind you that we are worshiping live in person 
um, at the Sanctuary Church in Fort Lauderdale on Federal Highway in between Sunrise and Oakland Park Boulevards. So we meet at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. Uh, we're taking all kinds of precautions. Uh, if you're comfortable, we'd love to see you in person. Uh, if not, we're going to be continuing to do this online. So thank you again for joining us. And before we leave, I want to send us uh, with these words, uh, these good words, God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. See you, buddy. Jeez. Hope you didn't film that.